Good morning, everyone. Recently elected to his third consecutive term as chair and CEO of the Inuvialuit Regional Corporation, Dwayne Smith was born and raised in Inuvik and has been the IRC's chair and CEO since 2016. The 42 directors of the six community corporations in the Inuvialuit Settlement Region, Aklavik, Polituk, Saks Harbor, Inuvik, Ulahaktuk, and Tuktoyuktuk, elect the chair of the IRC, who also takes the responsibility of being its CEO. Their mandate is to receive Inuvialuit lands and financial compensation resulting from the 1984 land claim settlement. From 2002 to 2016, he was president of the Inuit Circumpolar Council of Canada and also served as chair of the Inuvik uh, Community Corporation for six terms starting in 2004. Duane is a strong voice for Inuit as a member of the numerous Arctic organizations, including co-chair of the Arctic Marine Research Program of ArcticNet and was a member of the National Steering Committee recognizing the Canadian International Polar Year. Throughout his political life, he has been a strong supporter of Arctic land claims and in so doing has effectively driven initiatives in support of economic improvement in the North. As a committed campaigner for Indigenous rights in the environment, he maintains the importance of carrying on traditional knowledge. Please join me in welcoming Duane to the stage. Is this working? Yeah, well, yeah, okay. Just give it a couple of minutes. Ariga. Uh, Huvlami, good morning, everybody. I know it's hot. Uh, forgive me, I did bring my, my one of my traditional covers, my Atiklu, but it's a little bit too warm for that. Uh, no, good to see everybody, and uh, thank you for taking the time. I, uh, I'm not one for all of the, the fluff and the titles and the stuff. I, I'm just trying to achieve certain things on behalf of Inuit wherever we, we reside. So, morning, everybody. Uh, if I recall, green is forward, red is back if I need to, as it says. I'm going to uh, give you a perspective in regards to my views on what I see as governance and reconciliation as, as uh, it evolves uh, lately. Uh, a lot from, from my side of things, but uh, I do want to have the opportunity um, because I am just going to be giving you my perspectives and my uh, preference is to have a Q&A back and forth so that uh, you have a better understanding from your views as to what I'm trying to interpret in front of you here. So, like I said, I'm here to speak, uh, I've been asked to speak about governance and reconciliation. Uh, it's fairly new in my view uh, when it comes to reconciliation at the very least, but I'll touch on that later. Uh, Heather gave an overview in regards to what the IRC is, that's how we refer to it, the Inavalwood Regional Corporation. The history of it, it's uh, the second oldest modern-day treaty with the Government of Canada. It was signed in 1984. Uh, it covers a wide range of uh, issues, such as our rights when it comes to uh, harvesting, etc. Uh, we overlap. Uh, our region borders the Alaska border, so we have a, a portion of our region is the whole of the north slope of the Yukon as well. It's the first uh, modern treaty to also uh, create a national park that uh, we negotiated as well as a territorial park. The first two things that were created under a modern treaty with uh, Canada and the Inuit or the Inuvialuit of the, this region. Uh, the corporate structures and our initiatives, I'll try to touch on those a bit as we go through this. Uh, the governance Again, I'll touch on national legislative issues, international initiatives, 
as well as uh, go on to reconciliation and touch on the recent Inuit Nunungat policy that we created uh, with the federal government uh, through the Inuit Crown Partnership Committee or the ICPC as it's referred to. It's been in existence for just over five years now. And then I will touch on uh, the recent uh, child well-being law that we created, uh, the second Indigenous organization within Canada uh, to create our own law. I'll touch on that later, as well as the uh, Kanuipita, the National Inuit Health Survey, as well as different initiatives that we have underway under reconciliation. And I, I, I'm looking to the sound people. If I do go too fast uh, for the interpreters, just wave at me to slow down or not. I tend to uh, assume some things that I'm familiar with and I'll just start speaking. Uh, here's, uh, I, I want to touch on this photo a, a little bit, but um, in regards to part of our uh, COVID supports, uh, this is one of the initiatives that we undertook. I'm digressing a bit, which I tend to do. Uh, just bear with me, but uh, we were in Ulahuktuk, or used to be called Homan Island, a commu small community on Victoria Island, the west, west uh, side of the island there. And we were uh, giving certain uh, tools and equipment to community members so that they can sustain their own food security or food sovereignty uh, or, and or to alleviate or address it. And uh, this young boy's uh, family uh, won the draw for one of these what we call primer stoves that he used for cooking out on the land. So he was very pleased and happy with that. Uh, other initiatives uh, that we undertook with that were giving out fish nets, and I apologize if you're not a religious person or not, but taking a quote from the Bible, uh, give a person a fish and you feed them for a day, give them a, per a person a fish net and you feed them for life. We gave out over 400 fish nets within our region as another way of uh, trying to get our uh, I, I, we call them beneficiaries, or are Inuit or Inuvaluit to uh, rebuild uh, their ties to the land and or family bonding. So just other initiatives that we undertake uh, for that purpose. Again, I already mentioned that is created in 1984. Uh, one of our missions are is to continually improve the economic, social, and cultural well-being of the Inuvalu through the implementation of the IFA and by all other available means. Our head office is located in Inuvik, and we have, give or take, about 180 uh, employees under the regional corporation. After 14 years of negotiations with Canada, the Inuvalut signed the IFA on June 5th. So we recently had our 38th anniversary of uh, celebrating that, as well as the Yukon and the Northwest Territories were uh, signatories as observers. The IFA again was the first comprehensive land claim signed north of the 60th parallel, and only the second in Canada at that time. Uh, the Inuit of Northern Quebec, Nunavik, uh, Makivik Corporation were the first to sign uh, a modern day agreement with Canada. In the IFA, the Inuvalut moved from exclusive use of lands to shared use of lands in exchange for certain other guaranteed rights from the government of Canada, such as ownership of Inuvalut selected lands. We own over 91,000 square kilometers some of its uh, surface only and subsurface. The Inuvalut uh, co-determined wildlife management, we created co-management. Uh, you have to take the time into account. It was 38 years ago. So this was a new concept that was being considered uh, by Canada. And uh, once these uh, they used to say, okay, uh, you cooperate and we'll manage. That's how they interpreted co-management. But for a lot of you that are familiar with uh, co-management today, that's evolved a long way uh, from now, and that's where I'll touch on reconciliation a little bit. 
as well as uh, financial compensation in for us giving up uh, certain portions of our land. Uh, Again, I'm going to digress just a bit here in regards to the involvement and the creation of Canada. Canada is created on all of these treaties that were negotiated and signed uh, for the few hundred years that all of them have been in existence. Again, uh, some of the principles are the, to preserve Innovel cultural identity and values within a changing northern society enable Innovalua to be equal and meaningful participants in the northern and national economy and society, and to protect and preserve the Arctic wildlife environment and biological productivity. Under the Innovalua final agreement, each Innovalua enrolled as a beneficiary shares equally in the benefits received by various Innovalua corporations and distributed through the Innovalua Trust. As well, uh, I would challenge each of you to go to our website and go on to the uh, site that's posted here. It's a four-phase uh, quiz uh, or course that uh, basically it's a 101 of what the Innovalid Final Agreement is about. and. Uh, if you uh, complete the four courses, then uh, you would get a certificate. Uh, the beneficiaries, again, I'm not going to read out all of the, uh, the structure and uh, how we're organized. It was already read out to you initially. Uh, we do have uh, four principal subsidiaries which provide most of the corporation's operational funding, the Innovalid Development Corporation. Uh, that uh, has a construction arm. Uh, we're also partners with the airline with the Mac of a corporation. We both own uh, Canadian North uh, Airline. Uh, our Innovalid Investment Corporation that looks after the compensation that we received. That's the bulk of our investments, uh, and that's invested for the children of the future uh, moving forward, our children's children's children, we always say so. As well as the Innovalid Land Corporation and our Innovalid Petroleum Corporation. This thing moved by itself. Weird. How old is this building? <laughs> uh, under our Petroleum Corporation, we're, we're, we're sitting on, our region is very rich in oil and gas, and I know oil is a dirty word nowadays, but uh, the gas, we're trying to develop that. Uh, we developed our own pipeline, uh, geez, in late 90s, uh, sir, uh, providing uh, natural gas to the community I reside in, and uh, we're trying to develop a uh, further uh, larger oil that would provide uh, secure energy to the whole region for at least 100 years. We're sitting on over 9 trillion, at least 9 trillion cubic feet of natural gas and over a billion barrels of oil, but we're looking at developing the gas uh, for that purpose. Uh, just to give you some, maybe I should have just put a chart in this section, but uh, in regards to our departments, uh, to s just to give you some understanding of the governance of our organization, we provide beneficiary services. Uh, our health and wellness department is uh, the largest that we have. Its staffing is in all of the communities. Uh, we have government affairs, our Innovalid Science and Climate Change Department, our Culture, Education and Training Department, uh, Capacity Development, uh, Finance, of course, Legal Services, Human Resources, as well as our Land Administration and our, as we call it, CEDO, or Community Economic Development Agency. And that's the give or take 180 staff that we have that deliver these types of services throughout the region and beyond. Uh, we know we have 
uh, our data shows in collaboration with uh, our national organization, ITK, it shows that we have around 1,100 uh, Inuit in Nivalwit living in Edmonton, as an example. Uh, mostly, I would say Inuit, of course. Um, and so we reach out to them on an annual basis, and I'll touch on some of the reasons why in regards to our legislation development later on. Uh, moving on to the governance issues. Uh, the national initiatives, uh, previously we, trans before we all, uh, all four Inuit regions settled their modern day treaties, our national organization was tra uh, called the Inuit Taparusat Canada uh, to ITK now, or Kanatami, uh, which provides an avenue for unified Inuit advocacy with the federal government. I would, this time I want to point out uh, the president of NTI is in the room as well, Aloki Alokark. Uh, we work very closely with each other, and uh, I think it, the uh, cooperation and collaboration that we have just shows how well uh, ITK is functioning for the benefit of Inuit wherever we reside. Uh, at this time, I also want to point out uh, one of my elders that have just come into the room. Uh, Lillian Elias. As well as to all the other elders within the room. Uh, in regards to the uh, ITK itself, it says that we have uh, the land claim organizations are the voting members. We r rarely vote. Uh, on a regular basis, we might vote to approve the audits, minutes, the standard stuff like that. Uh, most of the time we reach a consensus or compromise uh, when it comes to sensitive matters uh, that are crucial and important to have us move forward on a regular basis, giving direction to ITK on a daily basis uh, so that they can do their activities. I touched on the Inuit Crown Partnership Committee. This was signed, if I recall correctly, uh, February five years ago with the Prime Minister uh, in Iqaluit. And again, it's with the four Inuit organizations, uh, which created a mandate for us to work with each other on a collaborative basis to address uh, not only Inuit issues, I would say, but uh, northern resident uh, issues, infrastructure, uh, Everything that people in the southern part of Canada take for granted, such as the health services, uh, access to education, facilities like this, uh, they're not available uh, to the extent that they can be uh, throughout the Arctic. Um, again, I'll digress just to give a perspective. I'm not expecting a university like this uh, tomorrow within the Arctic, I'm s saying that uh, we need to develop uh, something simple like uh, internet access and bandwidth within our remote communities so that a uh, person, you know, uh, delivering science uh, courses or whatever is sitting here in their facility but they're teaching the class in Ulahuktuk or uh, pond inlet uh, where they can reach the, the children uh, on a regular basis through that access, but we don't have the bandwidth uh, ability. So that, that's the sort of stuff that we lobby and work with on with the federal government uh, with and for. I'll touch on different examples of what we're doing under the ICPC as well. Uh, Heather, I'm not sure if I should point out that there are still other seats and maybe people don't want to go to go to where those are because it's probably much hotter up there. <laughs> and I guess there's another room next door as well. I'm being told that uh, people can sit in to see the live streaming. Not that we don't want to see you, but... Uh, I, the ICPC creates a venue for Inuit participation with Canada and federal ministers uh, in regards to the Inuit Nunungat strategies, such as the Inuit Nunungat food security strategy, 
developed last year, the Inuit Nunungat Climate Change Strategy, as well as the recent research strategy. So it's just other things that we've been developing together. So on an annual basis, the uh, four Inuit leadership uh, will sit down with the Prime Minister to assess uh, what's been achieved through the federal departments for the past year. And then at least twice a year, we'll sit down with different federal ministers uh, to discuss how the plan should be implemented as well as uh, how it uh, could be improved upon because for a lot of federal departments, this is still a very new initiative uh, when it comes to uh, this uh, ICPC. And it's a whole of government approach. Different legislative initiatives uh, IRC is currently engaged in include, as I said uh, earlier, the family togetherness laws, how we refer to it. Uh, Again, through our ICPC, we're working on national indigenous health legislation. So this doesn't just involve us. The federal government is also in discussions with uh, the First Nations and the Métis organizations, not only in regards to this, but the, the next one as well, the indigenous national indigenous languages legislation. As well, uh, ongoing through our four respective Inuit uh, treaties, we have self-determination and indigenous rights that we have to continually raise uh, with federal departments, as well as uh, the prime minister in regards to holding them accountable. Because when the federal government signed these treaties with the Inuit organizations, they signed on behalf of you. You as Canadians, are a party to these modern day treaties. So it's up to us to develop uh, agendas working with each other so that we can successfully implement our treaties. These initiatives require working both inside and outside traditional intergovernmental frameworks. Uh, I gave you the example earlier in regards to outside when uh, we signed our treaty, the federal government said, okay, you cooperate, we'll manage. Uh, no, that's not how it says in the in valid final agreement when it comes to co-management. So that's outside the tra traditional uh, colonial uh, approaches that have been taken in the past, and they're still there within the framework of the federal government. We're just uh, slowly trying to educate, provide uh, further clarity and understanding as to our perspective as how federal governance along with ourselves should be working within Inuit Nunungat. Uh, I should have pointed out as well the, the size of the land I'm talking about is 38% if not more of Canada's land mass alone. 38% of Canada's land mass, as well as over 50% of its shorelines. So just to give you a perspective of that, I mean, uh, it, it's huge. And we, we know the future is within our region for Canada. And when I say that, it's uh, the development of the resources as, as time evolves. So we're wanting to see these things, these initiatives get established very quickly before uh, things uh, start to get developed too quickly, and, uh, but we want them developed at our pace. IRC works hard to ensure the Inuvialuit community members, elders, youth, and leadership are deeply engaged in the development of these key initiatives. In regards to international initiatives, uh, the Inuit uh, being cross-border indigenous groups, we still have blood relations uh, with uh, Inuit within Alaska, uh, all the way to the west end, west side of Alaska. Uh, and occasionally, uh, in, Inuit will, uh, from my region, will go back and forth to uh, Kaktavik, a community that's very close to the very northeast tip of Alaska. Uh, to visit their relatives either by snowmobile or by boat in the summer. Uh, there's legal frameworks to protect uh, Inuvialuit uh, rights uh, to maintain relationships across jurisdictions. I'm not sure if 
many of you are uh, aware of what's called the Jay Treaty that was negotiated by uh, the British government uh, ages ago, uh, recognizing uh, the rights of indigenous peoples to go across uh, Canada-US borders because of our blood relations, but our historical uh, going back and forth before these artificial lines were put on a map. Uh, the Inuit declarations via the Inuit Circumpolar Council, I would uh, strongly recommend that you go on to the Inuit Circumpolar Council Canada website, or any of them, uh, to look up these two documents because uh, they're, they're very clear. They've both been recognized and acknowledged at the United Nations level for their transparency in regards to when it comes to Indigenous rights in general. Uh, the important assertion of sovereignty concerning specific issues, uh, marine and international shipping via International Maritime Organization. Uh, just recently, the Inuit are the first and only Indigenous organization. There may have been others since the last few months, but uh, ICC has uh, received official IMO provisional consultative status for the next just about three years, if I recall correctly. So this is where uh, governance and international reconciliation are actually taking place because an international organization such as the IMO is recognizing an indigenous organization and providing an opportunity for the Inuit in this case to give insights in regards to uh, how we want to see the international maritime legislation and day-to-day -day operations being conducted. As an example, uh, I am working with Transport Canada and the Coast Guard to identify shipping corridors within my, my settlement region. This is uh, nothing new. There are shipping corridors all over the world, and it's uh, just like highways uh, for vehicles, but it's to keep these larger ships in certain paths uh, to minimize the uh, potential impacts that they may have within your respective region, and it's to keep uh, certain adventurous or tourism types away from certain sensitive habitat uh, that we identify uh, where our beluga or our bowhead uh, may be calving, as an example, or sensitive spawning areas. So that's what uh, this is uh, other examples of what we're doing in regards to uh, re-identifying or uh, re-identifying governance, but also reconciliation in regards to how we've been ignored and uh, neglected when it comes to uh, federal governance within our respective backyards. Just to point out as well, uh, for our region, um, we took the initiative ourselves as an Inuit Inuvalid organization to create our own cruise ship management plan. So we're, we're trying to be proactive in that regard to ensure that uh, the cruise ship operators, uh, when they do come into our region, have an understanding as to how our communities uh, want to be addressed, if they want to be addressed. Uh, some do not want to be bothered by cruise ships at all. Uh, there's very limited benefit, but large uh, impacts that do take place on occasion. In regards to reconciliation, as I pointed out, uh, we recently uh, adopted the Inuit Nunungat policy, the INP emerge out of work at the ICPC table and clearly outlines who Inuit are and what Inuit lands are. This eliminates confusions with other groups as referenced here, uh, infringing on Inuit rights, funding, and most importantly, identity. The INP reaffirms rights in our land claims, modern day treaties. Uh, a lot of people do not like uh, this next one to be 
referred to in that acronym, so I'll just read it out. The United Nations Declarations on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, uh, the Canadian Constitution under 35, and that uh, federal government works with us, not with other governments. So under the, again, the ICPC, you know it, Nunungat policy, and now the government's governance, the governance directly. And that's being enhanced on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, it provides both governments with a renewed opportunity to develop programs and initiatives that are in line with Inuit determined priorities. Again, I'm not going to read this part out, but uh, some of you uh, may be aware, as I said earlier, the IRC Board of Directors passed the first ever Innovawood law in November under Federal Bill C-92. Well, I guess it shouldn't say bill anymore. It's actually an act. Uh, many provisions of the law are now in force and effect uh, under that process. Uh, once we file, uh, there's a one-year uh, time period where we negotiate uh, with the federal and, in our case, the territorial government uh, uh, on developing uh, our legislation, the actual law itself. Uh, but if we don't come to an agreement uh, with the territorial government of our region, they, they, they have to accept it anyways under this act. Uh, establishes that Innovalwood will make decisions about Innovalwood children, youth and families. Uh, coordination agreement, as I said, should be expected to be done by November of this coming year. Uh, this is where we see ourselves as taking back our responsibility in the day-to-day -day care of our children. Um, because it, We've allowed uh, governments uh, over the past to take control of us, and by taking our children out of our houses, uh, that's just one tool that has been used to uh, divide families and uh, have impacts on our culture and our family well-being. So we're working uh, very proactively, I must say, with the federal and territorial governments in regards to the development of this, because uh, my board there, most of them in the picture, see this as uh, probably the import, most important laws that we would create because it's uh, taking back the day-to-day -day administration of our children, as I said. Principles of the law ensure cultural continuity for each in outlook. ensure the supports available to enable in families to thrive, improve information sharing for fully informed service provision, advocacy, and decision-making, and incrementally enhancing innovative jurisdiction in child and family services at our own pace, in our own way. We do recognize we're, we're being pra uh, practical here when it comes to uh, some children may need uh, special services that can only be provided in the South and uh, will work with the uh, respective jurisdictions when it comes to those matters. But one of the reasons, well, two, uh, again, I'll digress for a second, but the Auditor General of Canada six years ago did a report on the government of the Northwest Territories on uh, child care. And the report said that uh, they can't even locate some of where these children are. So we, we, we have a problem here. Uh, two years ago, they did another follow-up report on that, and they said it's actually getting worse. So we said, well, how can it get any worse if you can't find the children? <clears throat> Sorry, sensitive habit or issues. Kanuipita, the National Inuit Survey, again, another uh, project program that uh, through ICPC, the ITK, 
uh, and ICC Canada is engaged in this as well, in doing a national Inuit survey to see where Inuit are when it comes to our health and status uh, across Canada compared to the rest of Canadians. So uh, IRC or the ISR is the first Inuit region that's conducting its third iteration of Kanuipita. The survey evolved from academic initiative to Inuit determined initiatives. Uh, we have surveyors and dental hygienists visiting all six communities or they have already. IRC to retain aggregate level data and data sovereignty to help inform programs and policies for our beneficiaries. Uh, IRC staff are presenting at this conference as well, so I encourage you to go and attend uh, their presentation uh, to get further details on uh, how this is uh, being conducted and uh, delivered. Uh, we do have uh, representatives uh, from the federal and territorial governments as well as ITK taking part in the surveys when they visit the communities as well. This is a very detailed uh, survey uh, that's being conducted. The last one was done 12 years ago, I think, and uh, we felt that it, there needs to be a consistent uh, process or survey done to ensure that uh, this part of Canada is not falling further behind when it comes to health services, but in reality, based on the impacts of COVID, uh, the Inuit uh, regions are actually falling much farther behind just due to burnout of uh, health staff, et cetera, uh, and the impacts that it's having on uh, communities throughout the Arctic. Uh, housing, uh, another example, housing and infrastructure initiatives through the ICPC. Uh, for ourselves, again, what we're doing is uh, we're doing uh, elder repair programs. So for those elders uh, living in the communities uh, that own their own units, uh, if they allow us, we're going in and doing assessments of their houses. Uh, to see what the repairs need to be made so that they can age in place, as we call it. So we've been conducting this for just about a year now. Uh, for Again, I'm, um, for those of you that aren't familiar with uh, the Inuit communities, 90 or 95 percent are only accessible by ship uh, when it comes to this type of material getting into the community. So some communities will only get one barge or a ship bringing in all their construction materials for that coming year. So you have to plan well ahead. And for some of our communities in my region, we're, we're living on permafrost. And we have to build uh, the pads, as they're called, the gravel pads, where these units are going to be built on at least a year in advance for them to settle uh, so that the foundation where this house is going to be built is uh, stable. Just, just to give you a perspective of uh, uh, the planning and uh, the initiatives that need to be done here. I, I'm very happy to say that this uh, repair program is going very well. It's very well accepted, uh, oversubscribed, and very surprised at the uh, amount of need that is out there. Uh, we do plan to move this to younger age groups, uh, five-year uh, increments uh, to ensure that uh, other uh, in Nivalwit, uh, that own their own place also can maintain and keep it. So we're trying to make them better energy efficient, uh, get them up to 2022 standards when it comes to that type of thing. Uh, R3 windows as an example, etc. Uh, instant hot water. I've uh, stressed uh, for years now that these uh, hot water tanks should be banned within Canada because all you're doing is boiling hot water 24 hours a day, 365 days a year when you, uh, if you put instant heaters in hot water uh, mechanism in there, then you're saving much more energy and it's much more efficient. Uh, infrastructure. Again, uh, historic announcement of Inuit in specific infrastructure funding back in August of last year. 
through ICPC, IRC directs funding to meet community development uh, determined priorities, our gap uh, within our region and across the uh, Inuit Nunungat uh, exists. And as historically, governments have failed to provide adequate infrastructure such as health, marine, military, community, etc. Uh, different collaborative agreements are an essential tool towards reconciliation, government-to-government -government relationships, enable IRC to self-determine and evaluate priorities, and to deliver on these priorities within our region for all in evaluate, such as food security, mental health, research initiatives, community development, uh, post-education, Etc. Uh, we have 95, give or take, uh, some do expire, some come on stream, 95 contribution agreements across IRC, uh, ISR divisions totaling over 80 million as of this time. Uh, other initiatives include the TB project and uh, food sovereignty again, but the TB project again, that's where a lot of Inuit in the north were sent south and uh, many of them uh, did not come back home, so we have a project with the federal government to try and uh, locate and identify uh, who's buried at these sites. Uh, again, another step forward uh, where the Inuit have raised this issue with the federal government and uh, another way of uh, addressing reconciliation. And that, uh, at this time, concludes my presentation. I was out of time. Child size desk. Hi. Uh, okay, that's wonderful. Thank you. So we have a couple of floating mics. We're wondering if anyone would like to ask a question. Of course, it's right up at the top. I'm coming. <laughs> Meet me halfway, Paige. <laughs> no, we do it like this for people who are hard of hearing. Thank you. Uvlami, uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Paige Kimiksana Krebs. Uh, my families are Kimiksana and Kikawak. Um, so it's nice to see a lot of Inuvialui in the room today. Um, I had a question. You talk a lot about, you know, doing this for our children and our children's children. And I know there are a lot of Inuvialui youth that kind of put climate change at the forefront. So I wonder how you balance um, all these great and like economical resource extraction projects with the youth voice and uh, kind of more climate focused initiatives. Oh, th thanks. And uh, Pierre says hi. No. <laughs> Her brother works for us as well, so ben beneficiaries. He's one of our, uh, one of my political advisors or political scientists. But uh, if, if you haven't gone on to our website, uh, we're presently advertising, re-advertising again uh, due to the revolving door for two new youth representatives, uh, staff uh, representatives. And when I say revolving door, it's, a, it's an issue that we have uh, maintaining consistent youth representation to give us their insights because they go away to go to school and or they get a different job or they need to get food on their table as well. So it's uh, it's an issue that we deal with. Uh, I don't recall in my presentation, I think I did say that we've recently not only created the National Inuit Climate Change Strategy, but uh, our region has, when I, when I see the national one doing that, that means we have to develop our own regional one so that we can create implementation plans and identify what we see as our uh, Inuit, Inuvalut priorities when it com comes to climate change issues. So we're, we've got that in place. It's the first uh, time we've done that. And we're trying to get uh, perspectives, not only from youth, but our co-management bodies, our Inuvalut Game Council, uh, to provide what they see as priorities so that we can develop that agenda moving forward and lobby uh, for consistent uh, funding to implement these uh, different research strategies. Uh, universities such as this uh, are uh, able to uh, conduct uh, different climate research uh, matters and have access to those funds under the different, different uh, national centers of ex excellence. So 
Uh, we want to work uh, with the universities, academia, foundations, etc. when it comes to uh, collaboration as long as uh, what's being done within our region is also being done with and for us so that we're getting the data that we want uh, so our communities can make the better informed decisions when it comes to the impacts. Like I said, uh, we live on permafrost for most of the part in, within my region. If you're not familiar with it, it's just a layer of ground sitting on ice underneath and as we warm up, the uh, ice underneath uh, begins to melt and the ground shifts much more so. And or with the ice receding in the ocean, uh, we're seeing much bigger uh, storms coming in from the offshore causing a much more uh, erosion. I have a community I'm dealing with when it comes to having to develop plans to relocate further inland because of the erosion issues and the rising water levels. I'm not trying to digress away from the youth issue, but I mean, uh, we always uh, do provide an opportunity for them to provide their perspective. Uh, we're, we've just recently got a new regional representative for our regional youth advisory council. Again, they're always changing because they're going back to school or getting a job, whatever. And we've been advertising for new representation to sit on that body. Thank you, Paige. That was a great question. Thank you. Patri Patrick Imbert, the University of Ottawa. Uh, what is your perspective on uh, security in the Arctic, uh, particularly considering the mili militarization of the Arctic by Russia and the interest of China in the Arctic? Well, in reality, when it comes to Canada and security in the Arctic, for the most part, I would say, what security? And I'm half joking there because uh, there's too much dependence on satellites in the sky uh, to monitor and observe activities on a day-to-day -day basis. And uh, what I've been stressing is that we need boots on the ground, uh, a presence, and uh, cost should not be an excuse just because of the remoteness or the isolation of this part of Canada if we want it to remain Canada. I mean, I'm being serious about that part because, uh, again, I refer to my area as the far side, uh, the back door, uh, because we're seeing Chinese, Korean, Japanese vessels coming into my region in doing research. But we know they're looking for resources. And uh, if Canada is not going to be there to put a flag on one of those high Arctic islands and show that we're using or living on it uh, as an example, then who's to say what right do we have? Uh, that's, that's the big concern that I have when it comes to, you know, uh, sovereignty. Um, and having a presence. I mean, sure, these uh, patrol vessels, the Harry DeWolf, uh, et cetera, that are being built, but they're only going to come up in the summertime. Uh, and then uh, uh, the military does uh, different exercises, at least in our region, but only when it gets warm in the springtime. Uh, I, they should come up in January and February uh, when there's no sunlight, uh, et cetera, and learn to survive uh, and or do exercises. I'm not, uh, I'm not trying to put down, you know, Canada's uh, military processes and or how it's uh, conducting itself but i mean it's it's very lacking when it when uh, you look at the different circumpolar nations and what they have done and what they continue to do uh, you know 16 years uh, being in the arctic council we're not supposed to talk about uh, military activity etc but you're always well aware that's in the back of everybody's head because of russia and uh, how they impose themselves in the circumpolar Arctic when it comes to military matters. Um, sure, we're a peaceful nation, uh, but we uh, on okay. We can't be laissez-faire about this. We have to uh, come up with uh, better approaches. I mean, the Nana Civic mine that shut down years and years ago, the government of the day 
uh, geez, over 10 years ago, said that they're going to turn that into a gas station for our ships. They're still talking about turning that into a, a gas station. And uh, icebreaker, you know, where's uh, Diefenbaker? That was talked about 20-something years ago. I was on a panel in Toronto many years ago, and I said, maybe the government's waiting for all the ice to melt so they don't have to build this icebreaker. But it's, these are real facts. I mean, we do not have infrastructure to look after Canada's Arctic. And sure, the population might be nothing, but if we want to protect 38% of Canada's resources, then we need to step up. I, I can't, I'm sorry, but. I just wanted to add that I'm not uh, an expert in regards to when it comes to how to do security matters, but uh, you know, visibility is one of the biggest things that I see. I, I've told the Prime Minister we need to see that flag flying very high when it comes to that part because we're getting a lot of uh, interest from Asian countries coming into that region. All right, I, I think we're just at the end here, so I just want to really thank you, Duane, for that excellent presentation. I think I, I learned a lot, certainly. It was really wonderful. Um, I just want to do a little bit of housekeeping, but please join me in thanking Duane first. Thank you.